Hey guys, welcome back to today's video. Today is Saturday, April 6th, 2024, and today we are going to be talking about the state of Nebraska and its second congressional district. Now, you might be wondering, why are we making a video today talking about a singular congressional district? What is so important about the Nebraska second district that it requires something like this to really be a national headline? Things covered by the Associated Press, NBC News, Politico, The Washington Post, and honestly, so many other major networks. And the reason for that is because Nebraska is situated as a state, one of two in the nation, that uniquely divides its electoral votes by congressional district. Since the 1990s, the state of Nebraska has voted differently in some instances when it comes down to their statewide delegation for electoral votes and their individual congressional districts. Essentially, what they did here was allowed congressional districts to vote for a candidate for president and have electors for individual districts while maintaining an at-large component of their map. For instance, with their five electoral votes, they allocated two to the at-large delegation here. Regardless of, you know, who's winning in these individual districts, whoever wins the state wins these two electoral votes. Then it was broken up into the three districts as decided by redistricting. So each district now gets an electoral college vote. And for a while, this was a system that was meant to really just increase the amount of attention on Nebraska. It was a system that was set in place to give these individual districts an opportunity to vote differently than the rest of the state, or in some cases, more heavily in favor of the same candidate that one party, you know, was winning, uh, the, the same candidate that was winning in the state. And, you know, it sort of came in around the time similar that we've seen in Maine, which has had this since around 1972, where Maine at large and then the Maine individual districts were able to vote on their own. And so Nebraska took note of it. They decided a decade later that they were going to implement it themselves. And now they, they are both just two states in this entire country, the only two that decide to apportion uh, their electoral votes by congressional district. And so as I was saying, for a while, they really had not voted against each other. The first time that any congressional district had actually voted against the rest of the state in Nebraska was in 2008. So you're talking nearly two decades after implementation of uh, this electoral system in Nebraska. And at that point in time, Republicans were a bit worried because they never really expected this to happen. Nebraska overall was not meant to be this state that could be narrowed down to less than 15 points, and they expected it to be pretty solidly conservative, and Republicans pretty much took control of Nebraska from years on end. They did have Democratic governors, they did have at some points Democratic senators, but more recently have become increasingly and increasingly more partisan, and today Republicans actually stand with a supermajority as of two days ago. And so Nebraska, while it is a state that, you know, certainly has its unique qualities when it comes down to this electoral map, actually was looking seemingly to revert it after the 2020 election when Joe Biden won that second district by seven points. Now, the reason why that is significant is because in 2008, when Barack Obama won it, it was still very much a swing district. And in many ways, it very much is, right? President Obama won it by 1.3%, and it was a very, very narrow race. And it really came in line with a bunch of victories that Democrats had phenomenally, right? In states like Iowa by 10 points, Indiana by 1 point, and Ohio by 5 points, right? Running up the margins in Michigan by 17, Wisconsin by 14. Nebraska second was sort of ushered in under this Midwestern wave here that had ultimately shifted this in entire nation to the left. South Dakota was eight points. North Dakota was nine points. Montana was two. Missouri was less than a quarter of a percentage point. I mean, it was quite literally an insane election for the Democrats. And so then four years later, when Mitt Romney won it, it reverted back to being a pretty solid conservative district. But Trump narrowed it up. But Democrats only got around 45 percent of the vote. It wasn't super in, you know, expected that Nebraska second would flip in the next race. But then it did. And it did by a lot. And so redistricting came, and they thought that that would actually narrow up the district enough that Democrats wouldn't really vie for it, or at least Republicans would be in a better place. They shifted the district about three points to the right. It's really hard to draw this district as a very solidly conservative one. There's, you know, a bunch of different things you have to take into account. It's the Omaha region. Uh, this also is a rapidly growing area, a suburban region that is shifting leftward regardless of what they're doing in the district here. And so they made it, in theory, three points more Republican. But then in 2022 was a really big wake-up call. Because in 2020, Don Bacon actually won by a larger margin than he did in 2022. And keep in mind, the district was shifted about three points to the right, and his victory was by about three points. And so Republicans looked at that and said, you know, Democrats invested less in the race in 22. There was less national media attention on it. It was not coinciding with a President Biden victory of seven points across the district. And it also just so happened to be a red wave year in theory, right? A significantly better year for Republicans than in 2018 when Democrats lost this race by four by two points. And then fast forward when the national average shifts 11 points to the right, Nebraska second shifts by less than a point to the right. And so it was a really, really big wake up call here coinciding 
with the most recent presidential election. And so now back to the point here, you know, Republicans decided that they wanted to switch to a winner take all system. And so since you know the context behind it, there is one final thing I think we need to understand as to why Republicans tried to do this in the first place. And as I'm sure you can tell from the title of this video, why it ended up failing, why this was something that really just simply isn't going to happen, at least for the upcoming election. And so the reason why it's been called into really a big question here for 2024 is because of our electoral vote map. What I've been showing you over the past couple of weeks is an electoral college scenario in which Joe Biden wins the electoral college with 270 electoral votes. And that would require Joe Biden winning Nebraska's second district. Right now, Biden leads in Pennsylvania. He's down by less than a point in Wisconsin and narrowing up Michigan tremendously. And so when Republicans look at that, they worry. They're up five in Georgia, up four in Arizona. They're up five in Nevada. They're up six in North Carolina, up 10 in Ohio, 10 in Iowa, 10 in Texas, 10 in Florida. The narrowest states, though, are Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. And Nebraska second isn't expected to go to Donald Trump. The data from that state, the data from that district, and even taking in previous electoral trends, Nebraska second is more than likely going to vote blue. And so when the Trump team realized that the mathematical pathway to victory, or the, the easiest pathway to victory for Joe Biden, wouldn't be through states like Georgia and Arizona like it was in 2020, wouldn't be through states that Biden couldn't even win in 2020 like North Carolina or Florida, and it doesn't even require a state like Nevada, which voted even for Hillary Clinton in the 2016 election and Joe Biden in the 2020 election. They can free that. It doesn't matter. Nevada can move over to the Republican column and Democrats can still win the election with Nebraska's second district. So when you take it out of the equation and you revert it to being a winner-take-all system, that would tie the Electoral College in what could very really be the perfect ending to a rematch that Americans didn't want in the first place. And what it would do here is give the Republicans the presidency. And you might be wondering how. I would encourage you to watch the Electoral uh, College scenario nightmare that I talked about about this. But to give you the TLDR, we would probably end up with a Republican president and chances are a Democratic president vice president, especially given people like Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski, who are in the Senate as Republicans, but still very much like to lean a little bit towards the left in major opposition to President Trump. And so you see here that, you know, because of this, it goes to the House for the presidency, the Senate for the vice presidency. It really doesn't matter who wins House control. It's about who wins individual House delegations across states. And so the majority of that state would vote for a person, even if it's a state, for instance, like California, it counts equally to Wyoming. It's all one. It reverts back to a similar to a Senate system here. Just every state has one singular vote. And chances are Republicans would win it because they have a lot of these smaller states and have the ability to win a lot of the you know congressional delegations while Democrats run up their margins in New York and California and so on and so forth. And so Republicans are hoping that in a scenario in which there is a tie, first of all, they have to get to that tie, right? They're hoping that in a tie they would win, but they might not get there without Nebraska second. And so the question here is how do you get it to happen? And so the Republican governor said, we need to move to a winner-take-all system. Donald Trump himself suppo supposedly sought direct pressure to a Nebraska state senator to get this on the ballot, to push this. The Trump team seemingly has been open about, you know, exploring this option of turning Nebraska into a very, you know, winner-take-all system, very similar to the rest of this country. And they've been public about that. They were not so public about the fact that Donald Trump did, in fact, call some of these people supposedly, right? I think that's not concrete. The campaign, uh, the campaign uh, spokesman for the former president said absolutely 100% the call didn't happen. And so they're denying it here. And I think the reason they're denying it is because, again, this failed, right? This did not end up passing in the Nebraska legislature. It's a unicameral legislature. There's no state Senate, no state House. It's all one, just state senators. So in theory, a state Senate, but they don't call it that. And it's technically nonpartisan, but Republicans do have, in theory, a supermajority. But they don't have a supermajority on the votes. And Democrats are going to filibuster. They are going to filibuster hard. And I think that matters. Because looking at the way that Nebraska has just continued to operate as this state that has had a lot of this attention on a singular congressional district, I think it's a good thing for Nebraska. I think the reason why you do see a lot of Republican opposition to it is because of the fact that it brings in a lot of media attention to Omaha, it brings in a lot of conversation, national discourse, and money. There are small business owners who serve in the unicameral legislature who are also from Omaha who look at this and say, I might be a Republican, but I know what this does for our TV, our radio, our news, our overall you know, economy, right? When you put up a field office in Omaha and you bring in hundreds of staffers or less than that, right? But a considerable number of organizers, people on the ground, whatever it might be, you're investing in that region, right? That's why cities often pitch themselves to host national conventions. It's not that they're partisan, right? You find that some of the most democratic states and democratic districts even will often, or cities will often find themselves pitching themselves to the RNC 
politics is this really, really big market. And I don't think people realize that a big reason why I think this Nebraska, you know, push here is going to fail is largely for economic reasons. Yes, of course, these, you know, in theory, people would want their voters to have more of a say in the electoral process. But I do think fundamentally, it's coming down to money. And it's coming down to the way that Nebraska has operated over the past 30 years. And a switch simply because a former president has lost the district, and it might make a difference in the outcome of the 2024 race, I do not think is a convincing enough argument to the Republican legislature here that you do end up seeing it pass. And so when it failed in the legislature, just eight people had voted to move this amendment on. They tried to throw it on as, you know, politicians do, tried to throw it on a bill that had nothing to do with the winner take all system, had nothing to do with the electoral system, it had nothing to do with elections. They tried to throw it on as an amendment and it failed because only eight people in the legislature decided that this would be, you know, the thing that they're doing. And because Nebraska has the ability for just 17 members to filibuster, 16 or 17 members, somewhere around there. Democrats have that number. They have enough people here that can hold out on a vote that it would make it impossible to get this to the vote, to the floor, and it's not going to happen. Right now, it looks like this is something that is just simply going to fail. You know, they're deciding to vote against it. They're saying now they're not even going to put it up for a vote. They have 250 other bills to get before close of session, and it is closing very, very, very soon. And so Republicans in Nebraska are saying, you know, this is a very last minute effort. We can explore further conversation about it in the future, but that's not our priority today. And I think Nebraska at large, too, you would find that voters wouldn't be necessarily pleased about that. I do believe that a lot of them, even in some of these redder districts here, do appreciate that there is an increased focus on a state that otherwise would just be completely cut off from any type of funding, any type of conversation, because it is solidly conservative. The state of Nebraska itself is not a competitive state. Democrats are not going to win it at large in 2024, 2028, 2032. And so there would be no reason to invest in any part of the state other than the, the Nebraska second district here, that does bring in a considerable amount of attention, a considerable amount of money, and does increase significantly the political relevance of Nebraska second. Because when it becomes a winner-take-all district, the amount of money being spent on the congressional race would also decrease tremendously. This is something that Democrats, I think, look at and say, we can bring our candidate over the finish line with a presidential ticket, but they may not see that otherwise, should this district not be as competitive and not be as focused on the presidential level. It has certainly gone back and forth, though. You can see here that in the governor's race in 2022, voted for the Republicans in 2020, voted for Biden, voted for Trump, voted for Romney, voted for Obama, then Bush considerably, 22 points in 2004, right? Similar amount in 2000. Even Bob Dole and George H.W. Bush beat Bill Clinton in this district here. So historically speaking, this is not the most Democratic district by any means. Historically speaking, it is a very, very conservative one. But I think Republicans are looking at this and they're worried that, you know, this could be the reason Donald Trump loses the election. Now, I will say, while a map like this is certainly possible, I do not think it's the map we will see this coming November. I think it's the map that would be most likely if you held the election today, but that's not saying a lot. A lot can change between April 6th and November 5th. There's so much that's going to happen. We haven't hit the conventions. We haven't hit the summertime. We haven't hit after, after Labor Day, right? There are so many things and so many factors at play here that I think genuinely this map is up for a complete shakeup. Does that mean Joe Biden or Donald Trump will expand? I don't know. I, I can't really gauge the direction at which we are seeing this country go, except for the fact that Joe Biden's numbers have certainly improved. I talked about it yesterday. His national numbers we've seen considerable improvement on. Statewide numbers we've seen considerable improvement on. And also some stagnation in some states like Pennsylvania, where Biden has maintained a lead for the past you know month and a half, which is good for the Democratic Party and not so good for the GOP. It also comes at a point where now this failure to push this is a loss for Donald Trump and a loss for Republicans in the state that were hoping to turn this into a winner-take-all system. I will say, though, as the one other way to look at this, too, if Nebraska does it, the main governor is a Democrat. She may call for a special, special session to push back on this and say, you know, if Nebraska is going winner-take-all, then so are we. And what that would do, essentially, is turn Maine into a winner-take-all system. Maine second would no longer be able to vote for Trump, and Nebraska second would be able to vote for Trump. And ultimately, you would find that the map ends up at the exact same. And so it's playing with fire here. Democrats are not getting on the offense in Maine, but Republicans are trying in Nebraska. But since it failed, because many of the Republicans on the inside know exactly what it means if it does fail, Democrats will find a way to strike back. And it also just is bad politics for them, because some of them are Republicans from the Omaha region that will likely lose the re-election if they decided to do this. You see here, the Nebraska second and Maine second often come in similar paths. And I think you would find here that one governor would respond to the other and you would equalize the electoral map and there would be a net gain of zero for either party, but ultimately a victory for the Democratic Party, which is why I think too, on that end, the Republicans look at this and say, 
maybe this isn't the right choice. Despite the governor supporting it, despite both senators supporting it, despite Donald Trump supporting it, it fails in the Nebraska legislature. The question is, will they raise it up for 2028? Maybe they will. Maybe it'll depend on the 2024 election results. Maybe if Trump wins it, they won't, right? But that's all a conversation for the future. But as of now, this Republican power grab, this Republican effort to take Nebraska and turn it into a winner-take-all system unlike it has been since 1992 has ultimately failed across the states. 1982. Sorry, not 1992. You can go back and see that, you know, oh no, it was 92. It was uh, 72 for the state of Maine. And so I think that you're playing with fire here. Both states have partisan legislatures, have Democratic, you know, advantages in Maine, Republicans in Nebraska. I do not think this would be something that Republicans would get out easily, and I do not think it's something that is even feasible between now and November 5th, but that isn't to say that Republicans won't continue trying. I just simply don't think they'll get through. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Subscribe on the left if you haven't already, and check out the Instagram and Twitter. At the bottom left of the screen, there's a Discord server for you to go ahead and join. On the screen, there's a video you can watch, and then a playlist for my 2024 election analysis videos. Again, thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you all later today.